So today I'm going to talk to you about my research and in particular the impact of sex on pain and what does sex have to do with pain. And just as a disclosure, um, those of you who think this talk is about pain during sex, no, that's next week I think and probably not in Georgia. But, uh, <laughs> But rather, I'm going to talk to you about the impact of biological sex on pain. We know that there are a number of disorders that disproportionately affect males or females. For example, autism and schizophrenia disproportionately affect males. Depression, anxiety, stress-related disorders will disproportionately affect females. So what about pain? Is there a sex difference in the incidence of pain and how it impacts um, society? So unfortunately, 20% of people will experience chronic pain on a daily basis. And by chronic pain, I mean pain that persists in nature, typically longer than a couple of weeks, and it's usually quite severe and debilitating. So um, is there a sex difference in the experience of pain and so forth? And instead of showing you him, I should really be showing you her because it turns out that over 70% of your chronic pain syndromes disproportionately impact females. These include fibromyalgia, temporal mandibular disorder, irritable bowel syndrome, and so forth and so on. And again, 70% of your chronic pain syndromes disproportionately affect females. So how is chronic pain managed and what can we do about this? So we know that morphine despite its fat, it's been around for thousands of years, is still the number one drug used for the treatment of chronic pain. Um, it was named for, morphine was named for the god Morpheus for his sleep induction properties, and it's isolated from the poppy plant. Morphine was first used as a um, common medicine in the late 1800s. It was given to pretty much everybody to treat women's pains, and if your children won't go to bed at night, just give them a little bit of morphine, it'll, you're good to go. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, right? So it really surprised me the fact that in 2019, we're still using morphine as a primary drug for the alleviation of chronic pain. So one of the things that really interested me was that given the fact that females suffer from the majority of your chronic pain conditions and morphine is the primary drug used for the treatment of chronic pain, is it equally effective in males and females? And you might say, well, I'm sure it is, duh. Well, it turns out that nobody's really asked this question for uh, forever, right? And it wasn't up until a couple, maybe 20 years ago, that people started recognizing that, hey, you know, I wonder if females are going to respond differentially to these different therapeutics than males do, and maybe we should pay attention to this. So that's what my lab asked the question Does morphine produce the same degree of pain relief in males and females? So, how do you ask these questions? So, one way you can do this is um, to bring college students into your laboratory. Everybody needs credit for a freshman psychology lab, and you bring them in, and it's not really called torture. You just <laughs> have to have a little fun. So you can <laughs> um, apply different stimuli. You can do a heat probe, tell me when it hurts, ischemic pain, just cuff your arm or your chest, and uh, cold presser pain, immerse your hand or your foot into an ice cold bath, takes a couple of minutes and then you pull it out. And um, my personal favorite, isotonic saline injections, totally not worth the $250 we pay you to do it. It hurts like hell, do not do it, okay? It's not <laughs> worth it. But we'll bring these students in and, um, and do these different manipulations, give them different therapeutics and see who um, responds better to the drugs, to the morphine, right? Males or females. But one of the things, and it turned out that in some studies, morphine worked better in males. Some studies, morphine worked much better in females. Other studies, morphine didn't do anything for anybody. And the whole literature was a total mess. And one of the things that dawned on me was that these are all really acute pains, right? So you put your hand in an ice water bath, it hurts for a couple of minutes, but nobody is getting a prescription for morphine because your hand is super cold or because you've got a paper cut, right? You're getting opiates for chronic pain management. So these type of assays that assess whether morphine's working better in a male or a female are remarkably inappropriate. 
So what do you do next, right? So let's look at clinically relevant pain, right? You go into a hospital, you have surgery, chances are they're gonna put you on a morphine pump for post-surgical pain modulation. And we can look at who pushes the morphine pump more regularly, males or females. Well, it turns out, these are data from a uh, person lab, and it turns out that initially, this is showing you time post-surgery and the amount of morphine consumed. And it, if you look at the graph, initially males and females are consuming the same amount of morphine. And then after a couple hours, males start consuming more morphine than females do, females tend to level off, and the males keep consuming it. So this data was always interpreted as, oh, the poor males, they're still in pain, they have to keep pushing the morphine pump, females have stopped pushing it, so morphine must be working beautifully in them to alleviate their pain. But it turns out that all of the negative side effects associated with opiate consumption, including headache, dysphoria, vomiting, nausea, you name it, um, all of those symptoms are exacerbated in females. So it's not that morphine is alleviating our pain and that's why we're um, not pushing the morphine pump as regularly as males do, but rather morphine is making us sick and we'd rather have the pain than deal with the negative side effects associated with morphine. So, still a problem, which sex works better for um, drugs? So one of the things my lab chose to do was then look at a rodent model, right? So we use laboratory rats, and obviously we can't ask them, hey, how's your pain level today? And uh, they say, ooh, hurts like, well, um, <laughs> right, they don't really talk that much. <laughs> and uh, so, but we have a variety of different assays that we can use or different tests to determine whether an animal is experiencing pain. So what we do is we will, bring a laboratory rat in, um, wine and dine them, and then we inject an inflammatory agent into their paw. And it produces um, inflammation, and most of your pain syndromes involve some form of inflammation, so we'd like to think that this is very clinically relevant. So we induce an inflammatory response in these animals, and then we give them morphine. And we'll ask the question, in which sex, males or females, is morphine working better? Well, it turns out that morphine works considerably better in males than females. So in this graph, I'm showing you degree of pain relief as a function of the morphine dose that the animal has been given. Blue are boys and pink are females. And we will draw a line at the 50%. So 50% change in your pain sensitivity. And then what's that dose for males? and what is that dose for females? Well, it turns out that that dose for males is approximately three milligrams per kilogram. Females require almost eight milligrams per kilogram. So it's a two-fold shift in how opiates are responding or how opiates are relieving pain for males and females. So why do females require twice the amount of morphine as a male? What's going on? So in order to explain that, I first have to tell you a little bit about how pain is relayed in the body. And so um, if you're like me, you're walking down the street and a hammer randomly starts pounding on your foot or at the same time you step on a tack and you're having a really crappy day. And so the pain signals are relayed from, out, from all over your body to your spinal cord and to your brain. And then you take morphine in order to block that pain. So how does morphine work? Well, morphine works by binding to specific cells in the brain um, called receptors. And if you think about it as a lock and key type of a thing, morphine is the key and it only fits into certain locks. So in that example, in this uh, receptor, only key A fits into that receptor. And that's how morphine works. It only will um, unlock certain receptors to produce some sort of an action, and in this case, it's the alleviation of pain. So um, obviously we don't have a bunch of locks floating around our brain. Um, rather, your brain looks something like this. Well, not really, but <laughs> this is a really cool video. And uh, so if you think of morphine as the purple substance floating around, and the green is the receptors, right? So morphine flows through the receptor, and somehow it ultimately alleviates pain. And you can ask the question, well, who has more of these green receptors in their brain, males or females? And it turns out that 
males have a lot more of these receptors in their brain or a lot more of these locks in their brain than females do. So this is showing you data from a rat. Um, on the top are the males and the bottom are the females. This is showing you the various receptors in the brain. And on the right hand side, it's showing you the gene expression. And, we, um, and clearly you can see that there's a lot more of it in males than there is in females. And we think this is what's providing the biological mechanism whereby morphine is more effective in males than it is in females. And one of the fun things we like to do in the lab is take away the receptor in the male brain. And that's what we did here. So that's that bottom panel. The opiate receptor is gone. And now males respond just like females in terms of their um, the ability of morphine to alleviate their pain. So. Um, this got me started thinking, right? I had this, I literally had an epiphany in the shower. Like, well, you know, if you think about your 300 gram rats, about two to three months in age, in terms of neurodevelopment, it's about 20, it represents a 20 to 30 year old, right? And if you look at this group, well, there's one of them that's not 20 to 30, but for the most, and I was talking about the dog, not me. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> thank you very much. But uh, so if you think about it, this group here is not taking morphine for a chronic pain. The chances of any one of these guys experiencing a chronic pain syndrome is pretty low. But rather, it's this demographic, right? The elderly. And it turns out that over 75% of people above the age of 70 are experiencing at least one chronic pain condition. So this got me started thinking about, hmm. I wonder what's known about the impact of age on morphine's ability to alleviate pain. So you have a population that is very vulnerable, chances are it's experiencing chronic pain, and does morphine work the, as well in this population as it does in an adult? Um, it turns out remarkably nothing is known about the impact of advanced age on morphine's ability to alleviate pain. Very few studies have been conducted and so, oh, sorry, my mom put that in there. <laughs> and so one of the things my lab now is looking at is what is the impact of advanced age on morphine's ability to alleviate pain? And it turns out, similar to a female, morphine is less effective in modulating pain in the aged population. So one of the things that we're working on now is to try to develop different drugs to, as like adjuvants that they can co-administer with the morphine to alleviate pain. Because you don't want to escalate your dose, right? You don't want to keep taking more and more morphine because that's very dangerous. Rather, what we need are different substances that we can take along with the morphine to improve, improve its ability to modulate pain. Um, and so, I would be remiss if I didn't mention something about the opioid epidemic when talking about pain and opiates, right? So clearly we have a problem here in the United States with opioid misuse. And a number, probably everybody in this audience has been impacted in one way or another by somebody um, who with an opioid use disorder. And importantly though, it's not your chronic pain patients that are contributing to this. Less than 4% of your chronic pain patients go on to develop an opioid use disorder. So being dependent on medicine is not the same as being addicted to it, right? Many of us in this audience are dependent on blood pressure medicine, right? We're not addicted to it, but we rely on it in order to have a successful and fulfilling life. Same thing with our chronic pain patients. And again, these aren't the people that are contributing to it, right? It's people who got a 30-day prescription for a wisdom tooth extraction or people who are taking it for recreational purposes because they're enjoying its euphoric effects, not your chronic pain patient. But unfortunately, um, we've established literature now or uh, legislation in order to limit access to opiates. So several states now, you cannot get a prescription for longer than three to four days. And when you think about your chronic pain patient, especially your aged population, this puts a huge burden on them and it's really limiting the quality of life. So 
in addition to the take home message of it's requisite to include females in all of your basic science studies, looking at different therapeutics for a variety of disorders. It's also um, critical that we start, instead of just having knee-jerk reactions and legislating everything, that we consider all populations that are impacted. So thank you very much.